So let's look at modeling millimeter wave MIMO channels for millimeter wave communications. And one of the main properties of millimeter wave communications is that the paths are very distinct. One of the reasons for that is because you need so many antennas. So millimeter wave is high frequency. You need lots of antennas to get the power uh, because each antenna can only transmit a small amount of power because they're small antennas because of the high frequency at millimeter wave. And so you need to be able to model this channel with all these paths. So we need a path-based model. So let's look here. This is a transmitter and a receiver, and I've deliberately drawn it at an angle so that we don't always think they're exactly facing each other because they never are in practice. And let's, let's assume there's a wall over here and there's a path that is bouncing off this wall. So here we've got multiple antennas, and so this signal towards this wall is going to be going in this direction in a parallel way from each of these antennas. And what that means is there's a delay between each of these antennas, and if they're uniformly spaced, then the delay between each pair is the same. I've drawn this with others in between, so that one's not the same, but the, uh, the way I've drawn it, but uh, if they're uniformly spaced, this will be the same delay. The delay, of course, is related to the angle. So the angle of departure from the transmit antenna array towards the reflector. Uh, and of course, that angle is going to be uh, as I said, related to that delay. So there's that delay there. And then for the second one, uh, there's another delay here, which will be double that value, um, and, and so on for all the other antenna elements. So this uh, angle here with these delays uh, gives us a, a vector that we can write down that relates the signals at all of these antenna elements. So that vector I'm going to call here A, uh, and actually I'm going to write its emission so that it's written as a row vector, and it depends on the angle theta. Okay, so that's a vector which I've written here as a row, and we'll see why just in a minute. Uh, and, uh, and, and this characterizes that angle of departure towards the reflector. Um, and then, of course, it's going to reflect off that reflector and go towards the receiver, and the same thing's going to happen at the receiver side. So this one's going to be characterized by its angle, which is a different angle, uh, uh, and it relates to how that reflector is uh, um, positioned relative to the receiver array. And so this one's going to be likewise uh, an angle uh, phi here, uh, which gives us a vector b. And so now when we multiply these two together, uh, b is a vector, a is a row, and that gives us a matrix. And so this is a matrix. I won't go into all the details here, but this is a matrix which tells us about the relationship, the way the path travels from the transmitter through the reflector to the receiver. Okay, so this is one path in our model. Okay, so what we're going to have though is of course we're going to have lots of different paths. And in, as I said before, millimeter wave, it's very narrow uh, beams and so the paths are quite distinct. So we're going to have put an L subscript here on those angles and we're going to add them up over uh, the um, L capital L most dominant paths. This is in our model. So this is our model for our channel H, which is the matrix which links the inputs to the outputs for the uh, antennas of the transmitter and the receiver. Okay, so this is, we're building up an equation here. Um, so uh, now the next thing to note is that these paths are going to have a certain delay. So our channel matrix is going to, there's going to be a time element. So this is going to be a time dependent, a delay dependent matrix. So there's going to be a matrix for each different delay value tor. Okay, so uh, where does that appear in here? Well, we're going to have a delta, uh, which is tor minus tor for the elf path. Okay, so this matrix is going to hold uh, for the elf path, the elf path, this matrix is going to hold and exist only for that delay tor L, which corresponds to the delay between the transmitter and the receiver bouncing off that uh, reflector there. Okay, so this is uh, um, our uh, getting there, but we've, we're missing still one term, and that term is the 
uh, term for the gain of this reflection. So this reflection is going to have, of course, a distance which gives us the tor, which means there's some loss, uh, and of course the gain will be related to that distance, but also it will be related to the properties of the reflector on the wall here. So we're going to give that a value rho, um, and we're going to call that um, for the elf path, of course. Um, and then uh, we're going to also note, so this is the row for the elf path, that's the gain. Um, and then, of course, this also could vary with time because as you move the transmitters or the receivers or one might be a base station and the other mobile user, so as we move around, we're going to be uh, changing with time. And so we're going to give this an S as a subscript and so this gain is going to change with the subscript. Uh, this is going to change uh, quickly um, compared to the angles of departure and the angles of arrival. Uh, and the reason for this is we're not, uh, once we've added up uh, or we're assuming what's happening here is that this is not just a straight reflector the way I've drawn it. We're assuming the model, this modeling, is saying that this, these two are fixed uh, and don't depend on S, which is the, the subframe uh, in, well, we call it subframe in uh, LTE. And, and for example, L, uh, S is a subframe, it might be one millisecond, which is what it is in, in LTE. So this model is assuming that the channel remains constant over a subframe. And that's an important point to note. And for example, one millisecond in LTE or in 5, 5G, 4G and 5G. Um, okay, so there's, there's the model here. Uh, these angles of departures and arrivals vary much more slowly, so we consider them to be constant in this model, um, but the, the gain varies at the rate of being constant for a uh, subframe, but changes from one subframe to the next. Uh, and that's uh, because of all the different characteristics of this reflector. It's not just a straight piece of metal reflecting. There's lots of different elements and components that add to that reflection and very small changes of the transmitter and receiver are going to change those values even though the angles are not going to change substantially for small changes in position. So that's part of the model. Okay, so let's now look at, uh, so we've got this, these things are defined, uh, with, of course this is defined, so how do we model rho? That's the important thing to define here. Okay, so um, let's look at uh, a model for rho, and so the standard one is to model rho as being a uh, Gauss-Markov model. Okay, so we're going to say that rho, I'll, I'll write it up here, um, rho equals, um, let me see here, so s comma l equals a, a version of a correlated from the previous time, so this is s minus 1 comma l, um, plus a gain term uh, 1 minus uh, mod of alpha squared uh, here, forgetting the, the, uh, the scaling right, uh, times nu, which is going to be s comma uh, l. So this term here is a, a random term, it's an IID in the model, IID complex normal with zero mean and again gamma l, and that gamma l is the power of the channel gain for the elf path at the S subframe. Okay, so this is the model for the way in which the channel gain changes with time. Uh, and so that's an important uh, point to note here that this is a model. Uh, it's a Gauss-Markov model. It's a very common one. Uh, and it, it essentially says that the current channel gain equals a correlation factor times the previous channel gain. So it's a smoothly changing channel gain uh, from one uh, subframe to the next. So now, uh, the, and this is defined here, complex normal, it's a random uh, component to that channel gain to model how all these small changes happen. Okay, so now we've got an equation, now we've got an alpha, so how do we model alpha? Well, under the um, what's commonly called Jake's model, um, but is actually uh, uh, probably uh, better no, called Clark's model, but you've probably heard Jake's model, um, so uh, Jake's model or Clark's model, uh, this modeling says that these reflectors, if these reflectors are all around on average, I mean they're random, but if they're, ra if they're placed all around the receiver uh, and all around the transmitter, then you, can, you get a value of alpha which is given by a Bessel function. And you can look up what a Bessel function is, but the parameter here of the Bessel function is 2 pi fc 
uh, times t of s, which is for this uh, subframe, the time of the subframe, the speed of the vehicle uh, divided by, or the person moving, divided by the speed of light. Okay, so this gives us this 2 here times the V on the C. Uh, this is the Doppler spread uh, times the FC. So um, there's another video on the channel about Doppler. Uh, you can look and see about Doppler shifts. But this, the 2 times, so the maximum Doppler shift would be FC times V on C. But half of them are going away. Uh, half of the time you're moving away from scatterers and half the time you're moving towards them because uh, you don't know. It's all random. And that's how you get the factor of 2 out the front here uh, in this Bessel function. Okay, so this is, um, uh, this is the now fully defined, this channel model, a path-based, because you're summing up over paths. You've got the angles of arrival and departure modeled in this part, and then the channel gains given by this Gauss-Markov process, where the correlation factor is given by a Bessel function. So let's just finish by, with some practical uh, values to see what these things mean and, and give us some intuition on them. So let's, uh, let's say we've got a one millisecond time slot. Uh, so Ts equals one millisecond. Um, if we have a speed, uh, or let's say we look at a, a table here, for example. So let's say for a different speed, a different carrier frequency, and let's look at what the value of alpha is. So I've got some uh, numbers that I've calculated here. So let's say for 1.4 uh, meters per second, and this is walking speed, 1.4 meters per second, it's about five kilometers an hour. Uh, if you had two gigahertz, then this value of alpha would be 0 0.9991. Okay, so that, well, that's telling us that the channel does not change very much from one time slot to the next, I mean, depending on this gain here, but it's very much correlated. So the next channel gain equals the previous channel gain, and of course this would be one minus alpha. So if the closer this is to one, the closer this is to zero. So the more, the less effect it has from the random aspect and the more constant the channel is. So this channel is very, very constant. If you're walking and you're using two gigahertz carrier frequency, which is standard for uh, 4G communications, 3G and 4G, and then you've got a very constant channel. Um, so let's look if you st have still uh, 2 gigahertz, but let's say you were moving at 16.7, which is 60 kilometers an hour, but 16.7 meters per second. If you're still at 2 gigahertz, then the number drops to 0 0.8814. So now you've got uh, 0.88, so that's cl uh, closer to sort of 0.9, maybe 0.9 would we'll say that's like 10% change. If, the, if this is only going to be 0.9, it's 0.88, but it's about like a 10% change from one, from one millisecond to the next millisecond. So that starts to be the type of change where you're going to have to really think about how you do channel probing uh, to do channel estimation so that you can be tracking this channel. Uh, so you'll, for that, you need to send known data. Uh, you need to measure what you receive at the receiver, and then you need to learn the channel gain. And you need to do that much more if you're traveling at 60 kilometers an hour than if you were traveling at five kilometers per hour. And let me just squeeze in here two other numbers. Uh, let's say you moved up to 70 gigahertz. So I'm just going to put that there for, for these two different cases. Uh, so 70 gigahertz for the 1.4 and for the 16.7, 70 gigahertz, so that's millimeter wave communications in the future of 5G and beyond. Uh, for example, we can see what we're going to have to deal with here. The number comes down to 0 0.194 for walking speed and 0 0.02 for 60 kilometers per hour. Uh, so this uh, really is a case, if you're going up to the millimeter wave, you can clearly see now that the channel changes significantly because this number is point, close to 0.2 and this one's 0.02. So if you're driving at 60 kilometers an hour and you're trying to use 70 gigahertz, then the channel is going to change very significantly, like almost ex totally change from one millisecond to the next millisecond. Uh, and in one millisecond, you've probably got something like 14 OFDM symbols. 
Uh, so over the space of only 14 OFDM symbols, you would have a massive change in the channel at 70 gigahertz uh, at these millimeter wave frequencies uh, if you were doing 60 kilometers per hour or 16.7 meters per second traveling rate. So that shows you the challenge for implementing millimeter wave MIMO channels uh, in mobile communication systems. Uh, there's really a big challenge for tracking the channel, estimating the channel, so that you can decode all of the data. So if you found this uh, video to be helpful, um, please give it a thumbs up. It helps other people to find the video. Uh, subscribe to the channel for more videos and check out the web page in the details below this video where you'll find a full categorized list of all the videos on the channel.